Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm doing another Kahoot, but I'm going to be going over HESI exit concepts, important concepts you need to know if you're going to take your HESI exit. And to be honest, it's not limited to HESI. You're taking ATI exit, or you're just taking your nursing program exit. These are great concepts that you absolutely, definitely should be familiar with. And this is for the LPN, LVN student. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Go ahead, give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And guys, don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website. I'm now a private, providing one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions and consultation sessions and Next Generation NCLEX reviews, both part one and part two. You can reserve your spot now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. That's nexusnursinginstitute.com. And of course, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms. So check me out on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, of course, YouTube. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. HESI concepts for the LPN LVN. First question. Which intervention should you include in a long-term plan of care for a patient with COPD? Is it reduce risk factors for infection, administer high flow oxygen, limit fluid intake, or encourage routine coughing? Which intervention should you include in the long-term care plan for the patient with COPD? Reduce risk for infection, administer high flow oxygen, limit fluid intake, or encourage routine coughing. All right, guys, very good. It is reduce risk factors for infection. Now, before I even go over this answer, I want to talk to you about the title because I made a mistake. This Kahoot is actually for the RNA. I'm going to tell you how I know. Look at the question. You see where it says include in long term pl care plan? Let me tell you something. Only the RN can create or edit a care plan. The LPN follows the care plan, but they, they cannot change the care plan at all. So I think I got my two cahoots um, mixed up. So I do apologize, guys, because I got to make that make that clear. Only the registered nurse can create or make modifications to the care plan. The licensed practical nurse follows the care plan. So now let's talk about this question. What type of care plan or what should be included in a care plan, long-term care for a patient with COPD? So they've got, you know, emphysema, they've got bronchitis, they've got sun, they've got COPD. What should be included? And it should be reduced risk for infection. That type of patient that has a chronic condition, they have COPD, they need to be the first ones in line getting their flu shot every year. They need to be the first ones in line getting their pneumonia vaccination. They need to be the ones being taught to stay away from crowds, stay away from people who are sick. Their lungs cannot handle any illnesses. They cannot get pneumonia, right? So you're going to teach them ways to stay healthy and stay away from infection or people who are sick. Where would be the best place to begin a screening program for hypothyroidism? Would it be a senior citizen center? Would it be a women's support center? Would it be a daycare or would it be a Native American reserve? Where would be the best place to begin a screening program for hypothyroidism? If you guys are on the live, but you weren't able to join in on the Kahoot, just go ahead, type in your answers on the live or the color that you think the answer is. Very good, guys. A women's support center. Why? Because when it comes to um, high risk factors or correlation with hypothyroidism, it's what? Women, right? So it makes sense to do a screening at a women's um support center. Senior center, senior citizen center would be for diseases or disorders that we see in geriatric community. Daycare would be for diseases or disorders we see in the pediatric community. Native American reserve would be diseases or disorders we see with that type of population, such as diabetes. But we're talking about hypothyroidism. It would be women's support center. Now, before I move on, something else that you guys absolutely need to know. 
You need to know what constitutes as a primary prevention measure versus secondary prevention measure versus tertiary prevention measures. You see this question where it says, what would be the best place for a screening program? Guess what? Screening, that is a secondary preventative measure. So let's go in order. What would be primary? Primary prevention measure would be something such as education or immunizations. The patient doesn't have it, but you want to make sure they don't get it. So you offer education or maybe vaccines, right? A secondary such as screening, you think maybe the patient has it and you want to test to see if they have it or how far it's gone. Something such as screening, such as a biogra uh, biography, um, <laughs> a biopsy or a mammogram or a colonoscopy. Those are screening measures. That would be secondary preventative measures. And then you have tertiary. Tertiary is when the patient already has it. You want to prevent it from getting worse, such as a you know, patient who already had a heart attack and now you're sending them to a rehab program, a patient um, who broke their hip, you're sending them to physical therapy or occupational therapy. The damage has already been done. You just want to prevent it from getting worse. So make sure you guys understand the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary preventative measures. A patient has been taking prednisone for several months and suddenly stops, and they report feeling very tired. What would be your nursing priority? Would it be to auscultate for breast sounds? Would it be to palpate their abdomen? Would it be to inspect for skin bruising? Or would you measure the vital signs? What would you do in a patient who's been taking prednisone for several months? They suddenly stop and they're reporting, you know, fatigue. What would be your nursing uh, intervention? What's your priority in this situation? Very good. You guys got it. Most of you guys got it. You can measure vital signs. And 12 of you guys chose auscultate breast sounds. And let me tell you something. HESI, ATI, NCLEX will do the same thing to you that I just did. Throw in something that has to do with breathing or airway or respirations to throw you off. Guys, you have to stop thinking like trying to be a computer and, you know, not thinking critically. Just because you see airway breathing, that doesn't mean it's the answer. It has to make sense for your situation. That's why you're thinking critically. Think about it. Patients have been taking prednisone, which is a type of steroid, for several months. All of a sudden, they stop. There's a reason we tell patients when you're on steroids, you have to, if you're going to get off the steroids, they have to be weaned off the steroids. We never stop steroids abruptly. You want to know why? When the patient's taking steroids and they've been taking it for an extended amount of time, what happens is the the um, um, steroids, the hormones that the body naturally would release, it stops because it's getting an exogenous source. So those same um, steroids that the adrenal glands were shooting out by itself, if the patient's getting it from an exogenous source, the body physically stops making it because it's getting it from an outside source. If the patient suddenly stops taking that steroid, guess what? It takes a while for the brain to tell the adrenal glands to, hey, wake up. We're not getting this exogenous source anymore. You need to start releasing more of the steroid. It takes a while. So what happens? The patient can possibly go into Addisonian crisis. Remember Addison's? where you need to add salt, add sex, add sugar, add salt. That's your mineral cortical steroids. Add sex. Those are your adrenal, um, not adrenal, um, what's the word for the sex? The uh, um, androgen. And then sugar, those are your glucocorticoids, right? Them stopping that prednisone suddenly can throw them into Addison's. And so we are going to be very concerned about those vitals. We're going to be concerned about that patient being hypotensive. We're going to be concerned about that heart rate being decreased. We're gonna be concerned about the patient being hypotensive. We're gonna be concerned about the patient being hyperkalemic because remember, sodium and potassium have an inverse relationship. If that patient goes into Addison's where you need to add salt, add sex, add sugar because they don't have enough of it, right? Their glucose is down, their sodium is down. And remember, potassium goes the op opposite way of sodium. So if the sodium's down, potassium's up. Why are we concerned with potassium being up? What does potassium act on? The heart. You're going to mess around and give that patient an, uh, a, a dysrhythmia? So absolutely, we're going to be concerned about the vital signs, not breathing. 
Okay. I threw that in because I know so many of you are going to jump to breathing and that's what NCLEX and HESI is going to do to you as well. So please make sure you guys are thinking critically. I see you guys typing away in the live. All right, let's keep going. Next question. Your patient is reporting numbness and tingling around the fingers and mouth. Which lab report would you review? What are you going to be concerned about? Would it be glucose? urine specific gravity, serum calcium, or the WBC. If your patient's reporting numbness and tingling around the mouth and fingers, what would you suspect? What lab report would you be reviewing? I love it, very good. Calcium. Nerve and muscle irritation, that um, numbness, that tingling, we're going to be concerned about calcium. Now, let's talk about it. Specifically, would we be concerned that the patient is hypercalcemic or hypocalcemic? Let me know in the live. What do you think? What are we concerned? Is this a sign and symptom of hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia? It's a sign of hypocalcemia. The calcium level of the blood is low, and that's why we're seeing the numbness and the tingling, and you're going to be concerned about tetany and, you know, true souls and chose sex signs, all of those signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. Very good. True or false? The purpose of the log rolling technique is to maintain straight spinal alignment. Is this true or is this false? What do you guys say? It's true. When you're log rolling a patient, the whole point of log rolling them is to maintain a straight spinal alignment. You don't want any twisting mo mo uh, motions of the spine. You want it to be straight, neutral, and aligned. And that's why whenever you're log rolling a patient, you can't log roll a patient by yourself. It takes what? Two nurses. Two people have to log roll the patient, not one, because if one person is log rolling the patient, on your, you're on the, uh, the upper side of the body, what about that lower? You're on the lower side of the body, what about the upper? You need two people to make sure that when you move that patient from one side of the bed to the other, that the spinal column remains straight. There's no twisting uh, movement. Your patient has diabetes insipidus. For which complication would you monitor closely? Would it be ketonuria, peripheral edema, elevated blood pressure, or hypokalemia? What do you guys think? Your patient has diabetes insipidus. Which complication are you going to be concerned about? Ketonuria, peripheral edema, elevated blood pressure, or hypokalemia? All right, let's talk about it. So the correct answer is hypokalemia. I noticed that eight of you guys chose ketonuria. Please, please, please do not mistake diabetes mellitus for diabetes insipidus. These are two different disorders. In diabetes mellitus, that's where the patient's blood sugar is too high. That is completely different and by the way, in diabetes mellitus, if the patient's blood sugar is too high, then they can have ketonuria, right? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about diabetes insipidus. And that's why I even gave you guys a hint in the picture. I, I, I put a picture of um, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. In diabetes insipidus, the patient does not have enough antidiuretic hormone. So instead of holding on to their fluids, they're letting go of all their fluids, right? To the point that they're at risk for dehydration. So we're not going to see per peripheral edema. They're not holding on to the fluids. All their fluids are being lost through the urine. So we're not going to see that. We're not going to see elevated blood pressure because remember what blood pressure is. All blood pressure is, is the pressure that's being exerted against the vessel walls. Well, you got to have blood and fluids for that to happen. If you have diabetes insipidus, you're getting rid of all your fluids, right? So the blood pressure is going to be low. It's not going to be high. And lastly, um, 
Well, I talked about those three. So let's get to the correct answer. You're going to have hypokalemia. And I want you to think about it. In diabetes insipidus, where you do not have enough antidiuretic hormones, so you're urinating all over the place. Well, think about it. What is coming out in your urine? Your electrolytes, right? So the patient can be hypokalemic. Now, remember, it was the last question, maybe two questions ago. I told you sodium and potassium, they have um, an inverse relationship. So think about it. All of this potassium is coming out in the urine. What's the serum going to be high in? Opposite. It's going to be high in sodium, the sodium stain. So you have a high urine output but you're going to have a low urine specific gravity. Why? All those solutes are where? In the blood. So the osm osmolality of the blood is going to be high. The urine output is going to be high, but the urine specific gravity is going to be low. Guys, you have to know this concept. Do not be confused and don't try to memorize it. Make sure you understand the pathology. So no matter how the question is twisted to you, you can still answer correctly. Okay. All right, let's move on. Select all that applies. Your three-month-old patient just had surgery. The infant should be medicated for pain based on which findings. Select all that applies. Now, you guys know, when it comes to select all that applies, you have to treat them as true or false to increase your chances of getting the question correctly. Don't try to group it together. Go through each answer choice. If it's true, you're gonna keep it. If it's false, you're gonna get rid of it. So your three month old infant just had surgery. They should be medicated for pain based on which findings. Here's your choices. Restlessness, clenched fist, tachycardia, tachypnea, hyperthermia, peripheral pallor of the skin. You guys like my coffee mug? One of my former students gave this to me as a gift. You can't see it. It says coffee, teach, sleep, repeat. All right. So let's talk about this. The correct answers. What are those signs and symptoms of pain in a three-month-old? Because an infant, can they tell you that they're in pain? No. Right. So you have to be able to observe for certain clinical manifestations to figure they're in pain. What are they? Restlessness, clenched fists tachycardia, that's increased heart rate, tachypnea, increased respirations. All of those are signs and symptoms that the patient's in pain. Not hyperthermia, them um, uh, developing a fever, a high temp, that's not a sign and symptom of pain. It may be a sign and symptom of what? Infection and not peripheral pallor of the skin. Absolutely not. But uh, the first four, all of those are signs and symptoms that you uh, may see in the infant when they're in pain. Which should the nurse assess first? Okay, so you have four types of patients. Who would you assess first? A three hour post gunshot wound with two centimeters on blood on the dressing, a two days mastectomy with 50 milliliters of blood in a Jackson Pratt drain, a two day post-op with no drainage on the dressing, but they have fever and chills, or eight hour post collapse lung, 70 milliliters of blood, chest tube collection chamber. I should have allowed you guys a minute for this question, I'm sorry. Okay, well, <laughs> most of you guys went with green and that's incorrect. Only three of you guys chose the correct answer. So let's talk about the correct answer and then we'll talk about the other ones. The correct answer, who you're gonna assess first is gonna be the patient that's two days post-op, no drainage on the dressing. Now that part, that's not why we're, we're, we're assessing them first. That's not the problem. All of those, you know, that's all right. Here's a problem, fever and chills. Fever and chills. Let me say this. And anyone who's been following me for any amount of time, I've said it to you a million times. You know what I'm about to say. Anytime you see in a test question that a patient had surgery, they had an invasive procedure, automatically, you need to be thinking about these three things. These three things need to be going on in the back of your mind because that's the answer that you're looking for. One, infection or signs and symptoms of infection, such as increased temperature, such as pain at the the um pain or redness inflammation at the wound site purulent drainage um 
foul odor coming from the wound site, increased WBCs, any sign or symptom of infection post-op, absolutely you better be looking for. And look, it's two days. There would have been a difference. Let me tell you something. If the test question said two hours post-op, it's only been two hours. We wouldn't be so concerned about infection because it takes a while for infection to develop. It's not going to happen in two hours, but this is two days post-op. So yes, we're going to be concerned about infection. What are the other two? Whenever we see a patient had surgery, what are the other two concerns, regardless of the type of surgery it was? It's going to be hemorrhage. That's the second one. You're going to be looking for signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, he hemorrhage such as decreased RBC such as decreased urine output, such as increased heart rate or increased respirations, right? Decreased blood pressure. We're going to be looking for signs and symptoms of hemorrhage. And the third thing you're going to look for whenever a patient has surgery is them developing a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. We're going to be concerned about them having pain in the foot or a calf or inflammation or God forbid that clot going to their lungs and now the patient's got shortness of breath or dyspnea. Those are three things you're always going to be concerned about. And for the correct answer, you see the patient just had surgery. They have fever and chills. Fever and chills are signs and symptoms of what? Infection. Let's look at the other ones. First one, a patient who is three hours post gunshot wound and they're having two centimeters of blood on the drain, drain on the dressing. They're a gunshot wound victim. It's only been three hours. They only have two centimeters of blood on the dressing. There's nothing on that that would make me that would make me say, let me run to this patient or let me call the healthcare provider. The second one, two days mastectomy. Okay, two days surgery. They have 50 mLs of blood in the Jackson Pratt. That's good. We expect that. We expect that type of drainage. Nothing wrong with that. Why am I running to assess them first? And last, Eight hours. So it's been eight hours that the patient had a collapsed lungs. First of all, the minute you see collapsed lungs, you know they're going to be on a chest tube, right? So it's been eight hours post-collapsed lungs, and there's 70 mLs of blood in the chest tube um, collection chamber. Between that and your patient that just had surgery, fever, and chills, you're going to go to the one who has fever and chills because we're not expecting to see fever and chills. But that patient who had the collapsed lungs, we're expecting to see some blood. So between those two, you always have to say to yourself, who's more at risk for injury? Who's more at risk for death? And that's going to be that patient that has fever and chills after the surgery. We're worried about them becoming septic. Your patient has Cushing syndrome. Which lab value is going to be most important to monitor? Would it be WBCs? Would it be RBCs? Would it be glucose or creatinine? Your patient with Cushing syndrome, which lab value are you going to be concerned about the most? Very good. Absolutely. In Cushing's patient has too much cortisol. Okay. Remember how we were talking about Addison's and they didn't have enough salt, sex, sugar. Cushing's the opposite. They got way too much salt, sex, sugar, right? So we're concerned about glucose, hyperglycemia because of all that cortisol that uh, the patient's releasing. We're going to be concerned about glucose. Very good. Select all that applies. Which signs and symptoms would you expect to see in your patient with increased intracranial pressure? Select all that applies. Would it be increased Glasgow coma scale? Would it be nuchal rigidity? Would it be papilledema? Would it be confusion? Glasgow coma scale of 15 or flattened jugular veins? What do you guys say? And it's select all that applies. So it's going to be more than one answer. Your patient has increased intracranial pressure. What clinical manifestations would you expect to see in this type of patient?
Okay, guys, so let's go over the correct answer choices. Remember, this was a select all that applies. So I'll go over them in order. It's not going to be increased Glasgow coma scale. 12 people chose that. Let me explain this to you. The higher your number on the Glasgow coma scale, the better off that you are. The lower the number, the worse off that you are. All right. So the best you can ever get is going to be your 15. Your 15, your awake, your alert, or your oriented, everything is all good, right? The lower the number goes, the worse off you are. Matter of fact, once you're less than eight, you have to be on a vent right? So it's not going to be increased Glasgow coma scale if the patient's got increased intracranial pressure. So that's wrong. Next, nuchal rigidity. We don't expect to see nuchal rigidity in increased intracranial pressure. We expect to see nuchal rigidity in something like what? Meningitis, right? We'd see nuchal rigidity. We'd see photophobia. We'd see headache, but we're talking about ICP. What about papilledema? Yup. All of that pressure, most likely from fluid, is going to be what? We'll see the uh, papilledema, yep. Confusion, absolutely. This is a neurological disorder. Of course, they're going to have confusion. How about Glasgow Coma Scale of 15? No, because again, 15 is the best that you can get. How are you going to have 15 if you have ICP? So that's wrong. And flat jugular veins. You're not going to have flat jugular veins. The patient, you're not expecting to see that. They've got ICP. If anything, you may expect to see what? Bulging. Okay, so the correct answer for this would be your papilledema and your confusion. Your patient with leukemia is two hours post bone biopsy. What should be your priority intervention for this patient? They just had a bone biopsy two hours ago. Would it be to assess their temperature, to monitor the skin turgor, to measure the input and output, or to observe the aspiration site? Your patient with leukemia is two hours post bone biopsy. What should be your priority intervention? You guys are killing me on the live. Let's hope you do better in the room. Really guys? So 19 of you chose temperature. All right, I'm not gonna yell. I'm gonna remain calm. But I want to talk to you about this because I just mentioned to you not too long ago that after a patient has had surgery, we're going to be concerned about three things. We're going to be concerned about infection. We're going to be concerned about hemorrhage. And we're going to be concerned about that patient developing a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. I said that, right? I know I said it because I was there when I said it. So I know I said that. Please pick up what I'm putting down. If those are the three things you're going to be concerned about, and I told you when it comes to infection, timing is important because if the patient just had uh, the surgery two hours ago, it's too soon for them to develop an infection. Why are we going with temperature? The question says that they're two hours post bone biopsy. Look at the question. Patients got leukemia. So we know those WBCs are low, right? We know what else is low? Platelets. They're already at risk for bleeding. Just from the diagnosis, right? They had a invasive procedure that puts them at risk for bleeding. And I told you any surgery a patient has, we're going to be concerned about hemorrhage. Boom. So how did only 10 of you guys choose observe the aspiration site? We're going to be concerned about hemorrhage, guys. You have to think about the pathology, what's happening in this situation. When it comes to infection, the timing is very important. You taking the temperature, that's going to be your priority. It's been two hours. When did the patient have time to develop an infection? How are you going to choose temperature over observing that aspiration site and make sure, making sure that patient didn't bleed out? Okay, I said I wasn't going to yell, so I didn't. We got that strained away. We're not going to do that again. Moving on. Select all that applies. Your patient just had a bilateral adrenalectomy. For which complications would you assess your patient? They just had an, a bilateral adrenalectomy. Which complications are you going to be watching out for? Here are your choices. Hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypotension, hypoglycemia, ventricular arrhythmias, hypernatremia. 
a bilateral adrenalectomy, what complications do you expect to see? All right, let's go over these answers. So adrenalectomy, that means both of the adrenal glands have been removed. Remember, those adrenal glands are responsible for your fight or flight response, right? Glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, those androgen hormones, right? So let's go hyponatremia, yeah. Why? If the adrenal glands are gone, What's severely decreased? The mineral corticoids. What are mineral corticoids? They're sodium. So they'll be hyponatremic. Correct. And remember, as I said before, sodium and potassium have an inverse relationship. So if you know sodium is going to be low, you know patient's hyponatremic, you already know the potassium is going to be high. Patient's going to be hyperkalemic. So now we're going to be concerned about what? The heart. What else? Hypotension. Professor D, how am I going to remember that? Think about the pathophysiology. The adrenal glands are gone. No more salt, sex, sugar, right? Fluid follows what? The salt. So no more salt, no more fluid. Remember, I told you that blood pressure is a force being exerted against the wall by what? The fluid, the blood. So it stands to reason no more salt, no more fluid. Blood pressure is what? Down, boom. Hypotension. Hypoglycemia. Okay, how do I know hypoglycemia? The adrenal glands have been removed. The adrenal glands are responsible, again, for your salt, your sex, your sugar. Salt, that's your mineral cortical steroids. Your sex, that's your androgen hormones. Your sugar, that's your glucocorticoids. If the adrenal glands have been removed, decreased glucose, hypoglycemia, boom. Let's keep moving. Ventricular arrhythmias. Professor D, how am I going to remember ventricular arrhythmias? Okay, adrenal gland has been removed. No more salt, no more sex, no more sugar. Follow me, please pick up what I'm putting down. If we know no more salt, hypoglycemia, right? Salt and potassium have an inverse relationship. So um, I'm saying hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, right? The sodium's down. We know potassium's gonna be up. Hyperkalemia acts on what? The heart is gonna cause ventricular arrhythmias. Duh, right? And last, hypernatremia, that is wrong. We know that when it comes to the adrenal glands being removed, the uh, sodium is going to be low, not high. Please do not try to memorize. Make sure you guys understand the process of what's happening in the body. So no matter how it's flipped to you, you'll be able to work through the problem. All right, guys, we're almost done. 13 out of 16. Which would be considered a primary prevention program? And you, everyone should know the answer because I taught this to you, which would be a primary prevention program? Would it be screening for HIV, relocating earthquake victims, screening for low-income residential homes, or education about immunizations? Which one falls under primary preventative program? All right, very good. So when it comes to primary, it's going to be education or immunization. Secondary is going to be screenings and tertiary are going to be things such as relocating earthquake victims. The victims already went through the earthquake, but now we need to relocate them so that the problem doesn't get worse, okay? So this is your form of primary prevention, very good. Your patient's experiencing a withdrawal from Xanax. You note agitation and tremors. What would be your priority nursing action? Is it to administer naloxone Narcan as ordered? Is it to obtain a serum drug screen? Is it to educate the patient about the symptoms experienced? Or is it to initiate seizure precautions?
very good. Most of you guys are correct, got the correct answer. It is to initiate seizure precautions. So here's the thing, Xanax, this is a benzodiazepine and what it does, it's a CNS depressant, right? So the patient's going through withdrawals, we may see um, a paradoxical effect. We may see the opposite effect, right? We may see CNS stimulation such as seizures. So we're going to initiate seizure precautions. I noticed that two people chose Narcan. Narcan is not going to work for a benzodiazepine. Narcan works for um, opioids, narcotics, right? So we're not going to give Narcan for Xanax. We're not going to do a serum drug screen. We don't need to. We already know from the question that they're withdrawing from Xanax. And as they're withdrawing and they're experiencing the agitation tremors, that is not the time to be trying to teach them about their symptoms. They're not going to want to hear it. They're actually experiencing agitation and tremors. That's not the time to try to provide education. Your patient has a new onset of diarrhea. It's important for you to question the patient about the recent use of what? Would it be antibiotics? Would it be anticoagulants? Would it be antihypertensives? Or would it be anticholinergics? Your patient has a new onset of diarrhea. What would you suspect would be the cause? What would you question them about? Very good. Most of you guys got this correct. Um, it's antibiotics. You know, antibiotics is a great medication. You know, it kills the bacteria, but it kills the good and the bad bacteria. Okay. So it could place the patient at risk for something such as C. diff. So that's why you're going to question them about antibiotics. I noticed four uh, patients chose anticholinergics. Let me talk to you about anticholinergics, such as something like atropine. This question says the patient has diarrhea. You want to know what anticholinergics do? They make you can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't shit. Excuse my language, but that's how you remember it. When it comes to anticholinergics, can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't you know what? So if anything, when it comes to anticholinergics, the patient's going to be constipated, not diarrhea. Our patient has diarrhea, so it can't be anticholinergics. Okay, remember that little poem for anticholinergics. Can't see, blurred vision, can't spit, dry mouth, can't pee, urinary retention, and can't constipation. All right, an older patient on the psych unit is suddenly confused. The urine specimen is dark and cloudy. Which would you suspect? Would it be depression? dementia, delirium, or that patient having a psychotic break? What, what do you think is happening? You have an older patient that's on the psych unit and they're suddenly confused. Their urine specimen is dark and cloudy. What are you going to suspect? Very good. Delirium. What is the delirium coming from? The UTI? Let me explain to you guys the difference between delirium and dementia. Delirium is acute. It happens suddenly. Dementia happens slow. It's, some, it's slow progressing. All right? Delirium has an underlying cause. Once that, once that cause is uh, corrected, the patient won't be confused anymore. Such as an elderly patient, having a UTI, you know how for your no, normal young adult, you have a UTI, you will have those classic signs and symptoms of infection. With the elderly adult, the first sign and symptom we see is going to be confusion. That's why we saw the clue that they're an older adult and they told us what the urine looked like. Dark and cloudy, it's concentrated. Most likely they have a UTI and the UTI is what's causing the delirium not depression. There's nothing here that says the patient is sad or they have anger or irritability or hostility turned towards self because that's what depression is, right? So it's not that. And there's nothing that tells us the patient's having a psychotic break. And it can't be dementia because dementia doesn't come on suddenly. It's slow. It's progressive. As time goes on, it gets worse. And there is no resolving the underlying cause. There is no cure for dementia. 
as time goes on, it gets worse. But the UTI, that UTI gets cleared up. The patient's not confused anymore. Okay. So delirium is the correct answer. Guys, thank you so much for playing this game. And let's see how well you all did.